Дамы и господа, для приветственного слова участникам Третьего Петербургского международного юридического форума на сцену приглашается председатель Организационного комитета форума, министр юстиции Российской Федерации Александр Владимирович Коновалов. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome you at the opening of the third international legal forum in St. Petersburg. This time, the plenary session is taking place in, at a unique venue, the new building of uh, the Mariinsky Opera and Ballet Theatre in St. Petersburg, the building that was officially opened only two weeks ago. Historically, uh, we, uh, quite close to this place, we had the first uh, permanent theater in St. Petersburg, Build of Stone, that which became the precursor of the Mariinsky Opera and Ballet Theater, which is very famous for a wonderful cast and a very good combination of tradition, respect for legacy, classics of international culture and new approaches, which sometimes may seem to be quite revolutionary. They have a totally fresh look at the at both classical and new works of art. Experts tell me that uh, the acoustic characteristics of this auditorium is simply wonderful, which allows you to hear every nuance of music played here. But no matter how beautiful or magnificent the hall may be, how elaborate the acoustic characteristics may be, how masterful the musicians may be, at the end of the day, the whole thing is justified by the content of pieces of music played by orchestras here. The content is in demand on the part of the public. They tell us about eternal values that have always been interesting for human beings. They tell us about man, about his search for truth. They tell us about love. And the law, similarly, is justified only no matter how wonderful the tools of lawyers are and how, no matter how high their professionalism is, if they serve eternal and fundamental values enshrined in law, if they protect human beings, their freedom, their security and safety, if they put an end to unlawful actions and protect justice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are absolutely sure that all the participants of the third St. Petersburg International Legal Forum and all those who are present in this auditorium share this understanding of law and law enforcement. Therefore, it is extremely important for us to see all the participants of the forum here for the third time in St. Petersburg. Again, the city is providing a venue for a very competent, high-level discussion of uh, legal, of the representatives of the legal profession, and they're going to discuss the versatile aspects of law and legal profession. We expect a lot of discussions. We have about 60 round tables planned within the framework of the forum. They are devoted. Uh, to a wide range of issues from uh, the law in the field of nuclear energy and all the way to sport and uh, subsoil resources and culture. We hope that the quality of this discussion that is going to take place every year at the International Legal Forum in St. Petersburg will gradually transform it into a kind of a business incubator for new ideas and innovations in uh, 
law and legal and the law enforcement that will be in demand not only in Russia but the world over. We think that the first two fora that took place in St. Petersburg be, uh, were quite a good overture, quite a good introduction, and now the time has come for the main part. Welcome to St. Petersburg, and I wish you every success during this forum. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite on stage the moderator of the plenary session, Alexander Vershinin, General Director of the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Library, Doctor of Law. Участники пленарного заседания третьего Петербургского международного юридического форума Валерий Дмитриевич Зоркин, председатель Конституционного суда Российской Федерации. Профессор Тимоти Эндикот, декан юридического факультета Оксфордского университета. Его превосходительство, господин Петер Тонка, председатель Международного суда. Его превосходительство, господин Иво Обсталтен, министр безопасности и юстиции Нидерландов. Господин Майкл Рейнольдс, президент Международной ассоциации адвокатских образований. Берик Мажитович Имашев, министр юстиции Республики Казахстан. Председатель правительства Российской Федерации Дмитрий Анатольевич Медведев. Good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, distinguished colleagues. I'd also like to start by welcoming all those who have come here in St. Petersburg to the third International Legal Forum. I believe that the idea of organizers who wanted to make this forum a traditional event, to make it to a certain extent a mandatory part of the schedule of a great number of lawyers has been put into practice. And I'm pleased to take note of the fact that my colleagues, most prominent experts from different countries representing different fields of law have gathered here. There are also many new participants it is very good that this hall is large enough to welcome anyone, but there are also those who came here last year and the year before. I believe that this testifies to the relevance of the forum. I can add to what has already been mentioned a couple of words about the venue of this forum. That is the new stage of the Mariinsky Theater that has been just opened. You're one of the first people who have an opportunity to see this hall. You can see that there is a building as far as acoustics are concerned. I believe that what I'm telling now is heard all over the hall. Establishing, creating such a complex is very difficult, but bringing life into these walls is even more difficult. It is somewhat similar to the task Russia was faced with two decades ago when it was creating the new framework of a new state, when a new economy was created. We are now celebrating the 20th anniversary of the new Russian constitution and the new Russian parliament. We have adopted a huge number of laws which have defined the development of the country over the last two decades. The fundamental documents and codes, such important codes as the Civil Code, have also been adopted, and we should credit with that the lawyers who are, among others, 
here in this concert hall. We cannot say that we have achieved everything, but this can never be. I believe and I hope that you will agree with me. The legislation is going to improve, to evolve, and the life itself will dictate the need to improve our legal system. A year ago, the plenary session of the forum was dedicated to the new challenges of law and the world. We were also talking about the competition and the cooperation of legal systems. Since that time, certain developments have taken place, and the overall instability of the world economy only attests to the opinions and to the conclusions which were formulated last year. New trends are also apparent, which have to do with the interdependence of national legal systems and their interrelation with the international law. Manuel Kant wrote about that. Incidentally, recently I've read a book by a very prominent Russian lawyer, Sergei Alexeyev. He passed away. Unfortunately, he was a very prominent academician. Now, several aspects I'd like to dwell on. The first one is the competitiveness of national jurisdictions, national legal systems, which is important both for the citizens and for the business, be it a small firm or a global transnational company. The development of telecommunication technologies, globalization of business, and national integration, all these factors have created an illusion that national identity and the nationality of a person or a company have no longer decisive meaning. Very often, people live in one country, own business in another country, real estate in a third country. There is no denied that the business environment is what determines the choice of citizenship. And there are even new examples I can cite which testify to the fact the same thing happens to transnational corporations which no longer feel bound by legal ties where the country they were established or where their government bodies are headquartered. And yet the economic recession, which has been a protracted one all over the planet, has revealed that such conclusions are somewhat premature. We witness that the need to support national business leads to attempts at nationalizing the legal systems. Sometimes it even leads to a drop in the pace of integration and even the re-establishment of border legal barriers. It is no surprise that in such conditions, citizens and companies seek the support and protection of their states. The turbulence of the global markets make businessmen more cautious with regard to the opportunities that are granted to them by their national legal system. And that is a reciprocal process. The country grants tax exemptions, credit has better rates, subsidies, counts on businessmen to follow certain procedures and to observe the balance between private and societal interests, not engage in any grace games. But this inadvertent nationalization has touched also the countries which have traditionally held their doors wide open for foreign actors. I can refer in this case to many European countries. Law is becoming a competitive advantage for the country when economic actors are returning under its jurisdiction. Certainly, it is a good impetus to any national legislator to improve the legal system and create a business conducive and investment conducive environment. It is important to adopt norms which rule out malafide competition. This sometimes happens. We need norms that establish norms 
in the field of competition between national legal systems that set a boundary for the nationalization and the liberalization of jurisdictions. These norms should not only cover the dispute settlement by the courts, but also the mutual recognition and enforcement of the decision taken by foreign courts, also legal guarantees as far as the requisition of property, penal prosecution or detainment are concerned. The legal mechanisms should be carefully thought through. They should be of a balanced nature. Talking about the concrete measures we are taken over the recent years, we've been consistent, and we've paid attention to that, and improving our competitive legislation, we're trying to increase the attractiveness of the Russian jurisdiction, trying to make the norms for business more transparent. Within the framework of the roadmap on streamlining the procedures for establishing of legal entities, we've prepared a draft federal law. It provides for the reduction of the time which is required to register a legal entity from five days to three days. The outcome of the roadmap should improve the overall rating of Russia because we are not quite satisfied with Russia's stance in these ratings. We're also trying to make Russia one of the 20 best and most business-friendly countries. We have submitted amendments to the Civil Code to the State Duma providing for the liberalization of legislation on non-public joint stock enterprises. It provides for the redistribution of corporate control, improving the accountability mechanisms for those who control the companies, including the so-called shadow directors. At the same time, we're also working on the improvement of an alternative to the court dispute resolution. I refer to the commercial arbitration, arbitration which is required by the business community as a means of rapid, high quality and professional settlement of lawsuits as a guarantee for protecting the rights of businessmen as well as their interests. So far, unfortunately, our arbitration system has not yet achieved the level which is enjoyed by the business in other countries. The more active we are in improving this mechanism, the better for the business and for the judiciary, which is to a great extent overloaded by routine cases. It is evident that the attractiveness of the national jurisdiction and a business-friendly environment depend to a large degree on the openness of the governance, the system of governance and the governmental services. We are now trying to upload more and more data on the internet by the governmental bodies. The draft laws, which are prepared by the Russian government, undergo a social discussion by the citizens, which improves the situation overall. The government has submitted a draft law to the parliament, which is aimed at an increased transparency of the judiciary. It makes it an obligatory requirement for the judges to publish the data on all out of proceedings applications on the cases which are currently underway. It also governs the accountability of judges. We are planning to equip the courtrooms with audio and video equipment, as well as widening the access to the information of their activities on the Internet. We see a positive effect of that. Certainly, we are faced with certain difficulties. Some of them pertain to drawing a line between the private and the public domain the personal data of citizens, the arbitration courts are most efficient in this field. They are providing full access to the dossiers and to the decisions of courts. There is another difficulty with the general jurisdiction courts. They deal with our citizens and their priority, just as in any other judiciary system. 
the priorities, the confidentiality of personal data, in order to publish the dossiers, the materials of the cases, the personal data should be withdrawn from the dossiers, and that is a very time-consuming process. Sometimes it is very difficult to draw a line between the private domain and the public domain and an information society. That is the task we are currently discussing with the experts and the legislators, and it is of great importance that we resolve it not to the detriment of personal rights. Another aspect I want to mention, that is the transparency, the clear rules of play what should be observed not only inside the country but also at the international level. The sovereign quality of countries and the property immunity proceeding therefrom as a peremptory international norm. Many Russian companies either directly or indirectly act within the territory of other countries. Everyone is well aware of the cases when they are discriminated against or when their property as used and taken advantage of and foul political play, there are threats to their property. Legal proceedings are often used as a means for putting political pressure on this or that country the company represents. And this certainly leads to tensions between their countries. And it also compromises the idea of the rule of law as well as undermines our confidence in the international law. Ultimately, it is detrimental to those who act unilaterally or breaches the international norms. We are closely monitoring such situations as just as any country. We are going to respond to them. If need be, we are going to act proportionately on the basis of the international law. At the same time, we pay great attention to protecting the rights of the Russian state and its interests within the territory of other foreign countries, and we are ready to take the reciprocal steps within the Russian territory. We are now preparing a special law on the property immunity of country. It is going to set clear rules with regard to the property of other countries within the Russian jurisdiction, which I believe is going to increase the competitiveness of the Russian legal system. And another theme I wanted to touch upon as the international regulation of investment. The drawbacks of today's international investment law, which was shaped as far back as the 1970s, 1980s, have become apparently seen in the last economic crisis. I refer to legal situation when an external investment investor is in a more advantageous position than the internal one. Such privileges have been granted in many countries. We also have it in Russia. We call it, metaphorically, the grandfather's clause, which gives the external investor a chance to be exempted from the entry into force of new acts and taxes or other spheres. There are certain exemptions from the national jurisdictions. Therefore, offshore schemes are created. There is a semblance of the foreign origins of the capital which is imported into the Russian territory that are also attempts at manipulating the court jurisdiction. This doesn't help real investment. On the contrary, it impedes them. It also distorts the gist of the international treaties on protecting and encouraging foreign investment, and we've signed a great number of those. We're interested in attracting foreign investment into the Russian economy. I believe we are doing very much to attract those investments. And as far as the volume of foreign investment is concerned, we are ranking within the first 10 countries. I believe that the rights of external and internal investors should be equally protected. And for that, we need new legal mechanisms. 
devising these mechanisms is going to be our priority for the near future. Many of the aspects I have talked about now, we have discussed at the G20 and other international fora, as well as when elaborating the legal basis of the customs union and the single economic space, we're trying to take into account the experience of other countries, the EU experience as far as the transnational law is concerned. We're trying to bring closer the national legal systems, harmonize them without, however, unifying them. It is important that our Eurasian project should retain the best that has been devised by our national legal systems on all the issues I've mentioned. Heated discussions are underway within the UN, the Hague Conference on the International Private Law and other international courts which are represented in this auditorium today. I believe that mutually acceptable decisions can only be taken on the basis of consensus with due regard being paid to the stances of all the parties concerned. I believe we're going to talk about that within this forum and this is going to be fruitful and will facilitate the resolution of these issues. Distinguished colleagues, certainly I have touched upon just at any fraction of the issues that are going to be talked about at this forum. There are many fields that are of interest to lawyers. One of them, I'm not going to talk about that. I believe others are going to tell you about it. The interrelation between law with the Modern technologies, social networks, the internet, I believe our forum can also contribute to the discussion. I sincerely wish all who have gathered here today fruitful and interesting discussions and wonderful impressions from your stay in St. Petersburg, one of the most beautiful cities on our planet. Thank you. Esteemed Prime Minister Medvedev, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, the plenary session has been opened with an introductory remarks devoted to the topic of our forum, which is uh, competition and cooperation between legal systems, the role of law in ensuring the development of the society, the state and the economy. The members of our panel today represent both the judiciary and bar associations, national bodies of justice, different schools of law. And as I can see, and as can, they clearly are, do not feel themselves to be debutants on the stage of Mariinsky Theater, on this absolutely new stage. Therefore, we can hope to hear authoritative statements and innovative ideas in the field of law from them. We have about one hour, 20 minutes altogether which means that each speaker can speak only up to 10, maybe 11 at most minutes. If uh, members of the panels have questions or comments with regard to the presentations of other panelists, please let me know about that. Traditionally, the main ideas uh, expressed uh, in the discussion during the plenary session will be summarized by its chair, Prime Minister of the Russian Federation, Dmitry Medvedev in his mm, final remarks. Dear colleagues, in 2013, in order to further develop uh, Russian Netherlands relations, we are holding the year of the Russian Federation in the Kingdom of the Netherlands and the year of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in the Russian Federation. Therefore, I'm happy to give the floor to a politician who was several times elected mayor of a number of Dutch cities, a lawyer by training, and today Minister of Security and Justice of the Netherlands, Mr. Opselten. You have the floor, sir. Dear Prime Minister, your Excellencies, um, it is an honor and a pleasure to, uh, to address you at this uh, opening session of the uh, International Legal Forum. 
an event with uh, growing international uh, acclaim. Uh, last year, uh, my former uh, British counterpart, uh, Kenneth Clark, uh, summed up the forum's importance when he said that this shows the Russian government's uh, commitment to the rule of law. And the rule of law and uh, legal cooperation uh, are also key elements of the current uh, Russia-Netherlands uh, uh, bilateral year. And that is uh, why we see a number of uh, Dutch speakers in the program for the next two days. And I hope they will help uh, make this uh, forum a success. When uh, President Putin uh, visited uh, the Netherlands on the 8th of April as part of uh, our bilateral year, he was welcomed by our head of state at the time, Queen Beatrix. And you may have seen coverage uh, of this uh, investiture of our new king, Willem Alexander, last month. Perhaps you also noticed his wife, Queen uh, Maxima, and one of her distant predecessors was uh, Grand Duchess Anna Pavlovna, daughter of a Russian Tsar. In 1816, uh, the Grand Duchess uh, married Crown Prince Willem, who later became became King Willem II in the Rose Pavilion of Pavlos Palace. And that's close uh, to where we are now. Our new king is uh, one of her direct uh, uh, descendants, her great, 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 great grandson. So, as you can see, our countries are connected in many ways. In his uh, speech, uh, to the Dutch Parliament, our new king said, democracy is based on mutual trust, and the people's trust in the government, one that respects the law and offers its citizens prospect for the future, but also the government's trust in the people, citizens who feel a shared responsibility for the public interest and are willing to stand up for one another. These words describe the essence of a democratic state uh, under the rule of law. The law creates guarantees for people, above all in relation to the government. And the law also offers people and businesses a framework of legal certainty in which they can live and work freely. Our new constitutional monarch, bound by our democratic constitution, was also stressing the importance of trust in effect. He said that if the government wants the people's trust, it must start by trusting the people. And the government needs to treat the public as partners in the democratic process, responsible citizens who can say exactly what they want. In order to underpin this mutual trust, the government must act transparently, be accountable for its uh, actions, and allow freedom of uh, expression. And as uh, countless studies have shown, the rule of law, legal certainty, and mutual trust are essential for sustainable economic uh, growth. In these times of uh, globalization, trust between states and cooperation between legal systems are essential too. And that's because they create legal certainty in an international trade, services and industry. And because they offer legal protection to citizens who travel across borders to work, to take holidays, or for cultural or from family reasons. The Russian Federation and the Netherlands uh, certainly have close ties in this area. 
Uh, for example, we have been working together for some time to modernize the Russian Civil Code, a subject with, uh, which will, will be covered in uh, one of the seminars. And I would also like to highlight the seminars on new and highly uh, promising forms of uh, uh, cooperation on forensic investigations and uh, cybersecurity. We face great challenges in these fields and we can't tackle them alone. The Netherlands Forensic Institute is in the uh, vanguard of uh, uh, forensic science, particularly in new areas uh, like DNA and cyber forensics. Our experts are looking forward uh, to comparing notes and exploring the, uh, the scope for cooperation with their Russian counterparts and others. The Netherlands is uh, glad that many Russian companies value our business climate. Our stable legal structure uh, and the quality of our legal system uh, form part of this. And very recently uh, it became clear that the construction of a Russian oil terminal in the port of Rotterdam would go ahead. And this 800 million euro investment will allow an increase in the, in the import and transshipment of Russian oil and oil products uh, via the port. And this shows our mutual trust and our faith in the benefits uh, of working together on economic and legal matters. Friends must be also feel free to offer each other constructive uh, criticism. Uh, the Netherlands makes uh, mistakes of its own and we are happy to discuss them. Not only to put them right, but also to learn from them. Uh, and where possible to stop uh, them happening again. We face uh, critical recommendations from Strasbourg and Geneva too. And we have uh, to listen to lectures. Sometimes uh, that's painful and uh, expensive, but we see it as pain for a purpose and an investment in the, in the future. Uh, we would continue to stress that a number of uh, uh, universal values are crucial to sustainable social and uh, economic uh, development. Uh, such as respect for the rights of uh, individual freedom of expression and the independence of the courts. Despite the differences between our countries and sometimes our societies and political views, we have lots in common. We have common interests and common challenges. And we have an open dialogue uh, to, the, 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 to discuss them based on treaties to which we are both party. Treaties signed within organizations such as the United Nations and the Council of Europe, founded on universal values to which we are both committed. And it is one thing to uh, formulate values in laws and treaties. Implementing and enforcing them is an honor. It is the difference between law in books and law in action. And the Netherlands is proud that The Hague is home to many institutions that apply these values to international legal relations. These include a number of international courts. Peter Tomka, uh, president uh, of the International Court of Justice, will no doubt, uh, no, no doubt uh, be saying more about them soon. And I look forward to welcoming you uh, to the session on these institutions tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. I also look forward to uh, continued open and uh, constructive uh, dialogue and to strengthen cooperation between Russia and the Netherlands, assisted by instruments like the MOU between the Russia, Pokatura and my ministry. Thank you so much.
Спасибо большое, господин министр. Thank you, Mr. Minister. The main speaker is also from the Netherlands, but this is ad forum presentation because now we are going to welcome the above-mentioned International Court of Justice, which is as well known, is well known, located in The Hague. It is one of the, the only principal body of the United Nations located outside the city of New York since 12. 2012, uh, the president of the court has been Peter Tomka, a graduate from the Prague University, has been uh, elected justice on respect of uh, Slovakia for a second nine-year term, and we have a unique opportunity to know, to learn about the uh, point of view of the president of the International Court on the practice of uh, international dispute settlements and new mechanisms of uh, their prevention. Thank you very much. You have the floor, sir. Dear Mr. Prime Minister, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am pleased to address the plenary session of St. Petersburg International Legal Forum, representing here the United Nations, more precisely its principal judicial organ, the Hague-based International Court of Justice. The ideals underlying the United Nations Charter call for establishing the preeminence of law, especially the rule of law, as one of the cornerstones of the modern international system. For one thing, one would be hard-pressed to deny that the values enshrined in the United Nations Charter help to build more equitable and democratic societies. That instrument's commitment to certain core beliefs and values is eloquent. One has to look no further than its preamble to see the consecration of, I quote, fundamental human rights and faith in the dignity and worth of the human person in the equal rights of men and women, unquote. Further, it also encourages the use of international machinery for the promotion of the economic and social advancement of all peoples. As a result, the international rule of law, which unquestionably forms part of the UN landscape and architecture, has fomented an international community geared towards bettering the lives of individuals across the globe. Undoubtedly, this objective is best pursued and achieved by strengthening the international rule of law on the international plane, which in turn facilitates the transition to more equitable and just societies. In fact, the Charter itself points out the symbiotic relationship between those ideas and importance of our holding international legal principles by striving, I quote, to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of uh, international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom." Unquote. In large part because of the Charter, international law has now become increasingly important. It is no longer wholly irrelevant in most states' decisions with respect to international affairs. It often informs domestic policy making. It is often actively considered in domestic judicial settings, particularly in cases involving international human rights standards and some other international dimensions, in particular economic ones. It is often referred to an in mainstream political discourse. It is increasingly brandished to justify upholding certain rights by members of civil society and other stakeholders. While the Charter has paved the way for the formulation of substantive standards and principles in international law, an equally important dimension of the role of law in ensuring the development of international society, the state and the economy, is evidenced by the multiplication of specific dispute settlement mechanism. In other words, subjects of the international rule of law must have fora 
in which they can formulate claims with a view to having their rights upheld. The creation of dispute resolution mechanism in various sectors of the international arena is a welcome development and a reliable means to ensure compliance with those legal standards and values that we hold valuable as an international community. For its part, the International Court of Justice, commonly referred to as the World Court, is vested with a unique mandate under the UN Charter as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. In short, the Court discharges the principal responsibility for delivering international justice and the UN system by peacefully settling the bilateral disputes submitted to it by states. In so doing, it always acts within the confines of its jurisdiction and strives to attain well-reasoned and just outcomes on the basis of the evidence submitted to it, the legal arguments put forward by the parties, and in accordance with the relevant rules and principles of international law. Moreover, its judicial function remains subject to the overarching objective envisaged for it in the United Nations Charter, that is, quote, to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity with the principles of justice and international law, adjustment or settlement of international disputes or situations which may lead to breach of the peace, unquote. This objective effectively mirrors the expectation enshrined in the same instrument applicable to all UN members, 193 states, that they shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. On an immediate level, the work of the court helps strengthen the role of law in international relations by settling the disputes submitted to it, but the reach and impact of its jurisprudence is much more persuasive. It has a direct influence on the development of international law. The court's well-reasoned decisions are widely perceived as authoritative statements of international law and are studied meticulously by legal advisors to foreign ministries, international organizations, states, and by legal scholars. They may also sometimes serve as a benchmark against which the legality of international conduct can be measured and assessed. The court's jurisprudence has also been an influential source in the work of arbitral tribunals and other international courts, which rely rather frequently on the world court pronouncements in developing their own reasoning, as it has been also illuminating for the codification projects undertaken by the United Nations International Law Commission. The United Nations Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, has attempted to strengthen the court's role in adjudicating disputes. In particular, he has recently called upon states which have not yet recognized its compulsory jurisdiction to consider making unilateral declarations recognizing such jurisdiction, an initiative that should be commended heartily. This constitutes a welcome and forward-looking campaign as it should encourage UN member states to envisage the peaceful judicial settlement of the disputes as a fruitful resolution model, thereby also furthering the objectives of the United Nations Charter. Excellencies, distinguished guests. No doubt, new legal challenges abound, but where there is a genuine desire and sometimes real need among various international actors to subject their disputes to peaceful resolution mechanisms. This encouraging trend is corroborated by the multiplication of dispute settlement mechanisms in various fora on the international plane. All these mechanisms share the common merit of striving to reduce unilateral action by states in conflicting settings, appeasing tensions between disputing states and uh, favoring peaceful settlement options grounded in law. Under this light, international law can no doubt be equated with a tool for shaping state behavior towards better patterns of compliance, steering policymakers and governments towards more just and democratic inclinations, and ultimately 
bettering the fate of individuals across the globe. The World Court will continue to do its part towards the objectives I have outlined by adjudicating disputes submitted to it with dedication, its utmost impartiality, independence, in conformity with international law, and within the jurisdictional bounds that govern its work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be representing the English uh, uh, law system. Professor Timothy Endicott is an expert in the area of philosophy and the theory of law. His writings were translated into Italian, Spanish, and Chinese. And I know that uh, he has lectured uh, in most of the continents. Uh, and uh, Professor Endicott has uh, for five years, for more than five years, been chairing the uh, faculty of law of one of the oldest universities in the world, uh, the Oxford University. Half of the masters of this uh, school of law are foreigners, another uh, means of exporting legal instruments, I would say. Uh, please uh, welcome, sir. Thank you, Professor Fischinian. And excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm a law teacher, and a law teacher has the task of giving lessons, and how presumptuous it would seem, to, how impossible to offer lessons to uh, the leaders in legal practice and in public service at, at the St. Petersburg Forum. And yet I'm so glad to have been invited, uh, because it's the hope of every teacher and students in Oxford, we're fortunate to have gifted students from this city and from each of your countries around the world. Um, and what's more, I feel at home because I know that from Mr. Medvedev and from many others in, in this beautiful room, I will receive the tolerance that one teacher accords to another. Mr. Medvedev is a teacher of Roman law, and that subject is compulsory for the law students in my university. We want our students to learn from the very roots of the civil law tradition. They learn, for example, what justice is from the Institutes of Justinian, a textbook for students written 1,500 years ago. If you haven't read it, justice is the steady and lasting willingness to give to everyone his or her due. If the lawyers of the common law world have a great deal to learn from the civil law of the Byzantine Empire, we have all the more to learn from the civil law today. We can learn from each other across time, across linguistic and jurisdictional boundaries, across culture gaps, across gulfs of geography and of geopolitics. We can learn from each other's wisdom, but I am sorry to say that we can also learn from each other's mistakes. I expect that those of you from Russia and from other countries of the civil law world can learn from the successes and the mistakes of the common law and from the benefits and the drawbacks of a common law form of legal education. The distinctive success of the common law lies in the facility that it gives judges to develop the law flexibly, while also using the doctrine of precedent to bring to the law a due measure of stability. The benefits of the stability of the common law are very clearly to be seen in the behavior of parties to international commercial transactions in the 21st century for whom the law of England or the law of New York has great attractions. English contract law is undoubtedly an excellent export product for the United Kingdom. But there is no guarantee that the English or any other judges will get it right in striking the balance between flexibility and stability. In fact, if you come to a contract law lecture in my university, I guarantee that you will hear the professor criticizing the judges, explaining why their latest decisions are wrong. This criticism is the stock in trade of a common law law teacher. It's the work of pointing out to students how the judges have got it wrong and what they ought to do in the next decision. So our students learn from failures as well as from successes. Not only in commercial law, even the story of the famous writ of habeas corpus involves a failure in the common law. The early common law judges invented a process for getting people into their courts as witnesses or as defendants, 
And then they started using this process to order prisoners to be brought into court so that the judge could investigate their detention. But as we tell our students in Oxford, at the crucial point 400 years ago, the judges failed. The king could not raise enough money from the parliament for his wars against France, so he imprisoned noblemen who refused to lend him money. When those prisoners asked for habeas corpus, the judges said that the process only applied to lesser officials and that they could not interfere if the king himself imprisoned a man for reasons of state. It took an act of parliament to make habeas corpus useful for controlling the decisions of the state itself. The common law will not achieve its potential if the judges do not make good use of the power that it gives them. And this is not just a historical problem, it is a current and pressing challenge for every common law country with which I am familiar. In habeas corpus, as in commercial law, the challenge is to sustain a legal and political culture in which judges carry out their role fearlessly, yet with humility. From education in the common law world too, lawyers of the civil law world may be able to learn from drawbacks as well as from successes. We teach our students the law backwards by starting with a dispute and asking how to resolve it. We have to focus on dispute resolution because of the way in which the common law has developed over centuries through the decisions of judges in resolving disputes. Students need to read the decisions of judges closely and they read especially closely when the judges disagree with each other. The result is that the student's attitude to the law is shaped by common law dispute resolution. This attitude supports independence of mind. It supports judicial independence among those of our students who become judges. It also supports independence of mind in the practicing professions of solicitors and advocates, which I think is really important. It's good to teach students that the law is controversial, that strong arguments can be made for unpopular or apparently hopeless causes and that the lawyer herself or himself must decide what to think. In a good law school in the common law world, the student learns not to agree with what the professor says just because the professor is an authority. But there are drawbacks to a common law legal education, even to a good one. We do not put this in our university publicity materials, but let's face the facts. We teach students how to make bad arguments sound plausible. We run the risk of encouraging arrogance in the legal profession. We equip students to become part of an industry in which they can charge high fees for legal services in support of claims that should not be brought and in making defenses against claims that should not be resisted. This form of education supports the rule of law, but the rule of law is not altogether a good thing. Don't, don't misunderstand me, it, it's essential, the, the rule of law is essential for the development of society in, the, in any country and in international law in the 21st century. But if you want the good things about it, you have to accept the bad things about it. If you want expert lawyers, you will have to give them the equipment to make bad arguments sound plausible. If a murderer has a good defense lawyer and a fair trial, the lawyer may prevent justice from being done. And yet, our country is worse off if a murderer cannot get a good lawyer. The rule of law has to be purchased at a high cost, and I don't suppose that any country gets it right. Your country, my country, have too much legalism. Arrogant judges and lawyers and waste and high fees, or they have too little responsible government and too little access to justice. Our country may have all of these things at the same time. So here is the lesson that we can all learn from the mistakes of the common law, from the drawbacks of common law legal education. If you want the rule of law, you had better be ready to face the drawbacks and to pay the price. Teachers give report cards to their students, and if we gave report cards to legal systems, there is one line that could go on every single report card for every single legal system you could do better. That's not the whole report card. Some legal systems deserve gold stars for making life in a community bearable and for acting with justice towards citizens and even towards outsiders. Um, over the coming days, ask yourselves what report card your legal system deserves. Ask the same about 
the developing systems of international legal cooperation and dispute resolution that you will be discussing. I do expect that every single report card will include this line, you could do better. So a system that deserves a failing grade has no excuse because it actually could do better. And if your system deserves gold stars, you have no cause for arrogance, you could do better. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Andy Collins. Uh, the uh, political and uh, legal communities are following the developments of post Soviet uh, states. Uh, the legal system of Kazakhstan is one of the most dynamically developing systems in the world, and uh, uh, its significance is especially felt uh, within the CIS uh, space. Uh, as you may understand, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Berry. Uh, 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 Doctor of Law and the Minister of Justice of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Uh, Dmitry Anatolovich, uh, members of the forum, uh, annually the interest uh, to the St. Petersburg uh, legal forum has been growing. Uh, uh, an evident proof of which uh, is the geography of uh, the representation of members of the forum. And this is only obvious because the age of globalization has been dictating the need for integration between the national legal systems. Uh, and that is why the uh, interest of both uh, public and non-public uh, lawyers has been growing. Uh, we can, thanks to this forum, uh, analyze the state and dynamic of the development uh, in the national uh, legal systems uh, and the degree of the interaction between of such uh, national systems with international legal acts. I would like to thank the organizers of this forum and its participants for the uh, comprehensiveness uh, 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 and the uh, sustainability uh, uh, professionalism of the uh, issues discussed. Uh, as is known, in today's world, uh, we see a stable tendency towards uh, different forms of interaction between the international and uh, domestic laws. Uh, the changes of one of which uh, uh, lead to uh, changes in the other. Any uh, lagging behind uh, from the requirements of today's world can decelerate the development of uh, countries, uh, and its international and the international integration. In, the, in its uh, his address, the search of Kazakhstan 2050, uh, uh, the new political course of uh, an accomplished state, the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Nazarbayev, mentioned that uh, legislation should not only protect national interests, but uh, be synchronized with the uh, dynamically developing uh, legal environment. Undoubtedly, in this uh, sense, uh, the developing legal environment is understood uh, also as the international uh, legal uh, commitments of a state. Uh, the government of Kazakhstan has been uh, adopting measures uh, directed at increasing and improving competitiveness of the Kazakhstan uh, legal uh, system in all uh, basic areas. Uh, the idea of a Eurasian integration, which was proposed uh, first in 1994 by the head of our state uh, at Moscow State University, has been uh, today accomplished into creating a single economic space. Uh, I think that uh, any successful establishment of a Eurasian Economic uh, Union with the participation of the Republic of Kazakhstan, the Russian Federation, and the Republic of Belarus uh, uh, should be based on a common uh, international uh, and uh, contractual basis, harmonization and unification of the economic legislation of these countries. Uh, today, uh, the definitions of harmonization and unification of legislation are all uh, well presented in uh, theoretical research. But in the national legislation of the Republic of Belarus, the Republic of Kazakhstan, and Russian Federation, they have not yet been fully implemented. Uh, 
uh, higher rate these definitions, uh, the main forms of uh, legal uh, inter integration. And in this connection, we need to pose ourselves a question whether we should really formalize uh, and regularize uh, such uh, legal definitions. And if yes, then at which level? Uh, in uh, domestic laws or, or uh, within the framework of any specific international uh, public agreements? Uh, focusing uh, your attention on this, I would like to stress that the importance of uh, defining the, of, uh, and developing a single position of the countries uh, towards this concept. Uh, for example, currently, as part of the single economic space, uh, we are discussing the draft model law on competition. This law would uh, lay out the organizational and the legal foundations of protecting competition and providing a free movement of goods by preventing uh, the monopoly and um, uh, undue competition and uh, prevention of any limitations uh, or infringement uh, of the uh, due competition uh, on the part of the government. Uh, the adoption of such a law would also uh, uh, lead to a harmonization of the national legislations uh, of the three countries. However, should it be uh, done by way of rapprochement, harmonization, or unification of national legislations in the area? area of competition, policy remains a question. Uh, we know that in the theory, uh, the uh, rapprochement of legislation, uh, bringing together of, uh, legislation uh, is uh, viewed as a process under which the common course of uh, countries uh, is defined. Harmonization is uh, about uh, common uh, legal principles, approaches, and concepts of development of national legislations, and unification means uh, coordinated uh, enforcement uh, by several countries of uh, identical uh, norms. I However, in the uh, draft model law and competition as uh, part of its uh, uh, purpose, uh, only rapprochement of the legal uh, regulation of economic relationships uh, has been defined as one of its uh, uh, goals. Uh, although that model law already contains some common principles and approaches of countries to this uh, issue. Uh, we, uh, we think that uh, whether it would be done by way of rapprochement, harmonization, or new unification should be probably decided in uh, each of the three countries, or whether it should be done uh, through an international agreement on this. Uh, this uh, would be demonstrated by the law enforcement practice in future. We think that uh, national interest should also be taken into account uh, when uh, completing the work on this. And we also need to think about the national priorities that are defined in the constitutions of our countries, which subordinate uh, uh, the international uh, laws uh, norms uh, to domestic law and the national uh, legal uh, practice. Uh, however, this is part uh, probably something to discuss uh, at a technical level and also here in the St. Petersburg International Legal Forum. Thank you very much uh, for having the opportunity to speak at this forum. Thank you, Mr. Minister. The year 2013 is, among other things, the year when we see the 20th anniversary of the Constitution of Russia. The Constitution, in fact, in many ways determines the development of the state and of the society, the legislation and the judicial practice. This development uh, should be alongside with the major law of the Constitutional Court of Russia. And it is not random that its chair, Doctor of Law, Professor Valery Zorkin, is a permanent participant of the St. Petersburg International Legal Forum. Valery Dmitrievich, you have the floor. Esteemed Dmitry Anatolievich, esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to act as a chair of the Constitutional Court here. I'm not going to talk our business. I'm going to focus on the things that are encouraged 
by the fact that we are working in the constitutional courts at the Senate Square. I'm going to talk about the law under the circumstances of global changes. This is something I've tackled over the past years as a researcher. The contemporary law is today living under the conditions of the global changes. However, we will understand that changes are not only about the new opportunities, but at the same time about the high level of risks of an indefinite and secure future. Voltaire was once asked to say what makes the donkey different from a human being. And he said, well, the donkey goes in circles and human beings develop in a spur-like way. However, this way goes downward to the infernal circles and upward as well. And also Voltaire said that the donkey doesn't have any choice, whereas a human being does. He does have a choice between these two developmental vectors. So in the reality, we are living today, we do see that there is a movement for the better and for the worse. At any rate, the researchers and the practitioners alike are there to state a very dangerous destruction of the international legal system, and we are seeing exceedingly frequent and active attempts of major states as well as the formal and informal state coalitions to replace the functions of the Security Council and of the United Nations by their decisions and judgments as well as the attempts at imposing to sovereign states their internal economic and social policies that would be in direct opposition to the constitutions of the states. So we see that in the world they emerge um, exceedingly the states and the state coalitions that effectively seem to appropriate the advantages and the authorities of the international lawmaking and law enforcement and ultimately that violate the contractual nature of the international lawmaking process and the activities of the court that are based on these conventions and concepts. Essentially, this means that the law-making ways, uh, that the legal ways to resolve issues are replaced by the unlawful ones. We have here in, an example from the state catastrophe in Libya that is not entirely conceived by the international community in legal terms. We do not yet fully understand the impact of this catastrophe as a long-term chaos generator in Libya, in vast regions of Africa as well as the impact of the campaign against Libya for the global world as an unlawful precedence of the law enforcement-based intervention of a new type into a national state. And also, I will dare state that the events in Libya and Egypt and in Syria, as well as the events related to the expropriation of money of the investors in the Cyprus, are not just the signs of the new era of global turbulence, as Condoleezza Rice put it. It's essentially a way to fully deny the principles of human life that came in with the era of the modernity that we are used to consider as part and parcel of our existence as air that we breathe in. And in fact, the regulations are being made ambiguous and vague, not only on the international level. Novelty can be different, and we learn from history that the flow of novelty and innovation cannot be confined um, into, within, within the banks uh, by well thought through and timely legal measures. If this doesn't happen, essentially chaos rules, the chaos of trouble, wars and revolutions. So the regulatory legal reforms are at all times one of the major aspects of the institutional formalization of any kind of social transformations. And this formalization should be very cautious, very well thought through, and definitely this is my conclusion, and in fact, oftentimes a lot of legal um, norms and regulations are there to institutionalize the relations that are already abound in the society retrospectively, uh, and retrospectively, these are the relations that have formed in the society in regular situations. That this makes it possible to regulate the future, but in the situations of crisis or transition, such experience is not always an assistant, and this is not true only of the daily life experience, it's true of the social and political and legal experiences alike. And here the lawyers are risking becoming like the generals who, while preparing for the former wars, are losing the 
future ones. In fact, it's all about the methodology of reforms. It's about the methodology of managing the future, and I do apologize for this daring metaphor. Methodologically, um, we can relate to the Singapore miracle and the reform by Lee Kuan Yew. Successful reforming is something I would call effective management of the future, but at the same time, this kind of reforms have another specific property. They are based on a very sound social foundation. Without this sound social foundation, any reform would get stuck up in the air. Also, the precise legal regulation, uh, regularity uh, should be there. In fact, if the actions of the reformers do not go against the mass or public views of what is just and due, the see the formation of the social pillar that is called authoritarian modernization. Today we already see some examples of successful modernizations in the West from Holland and England to France and Germany and in the Eastern societies as well, Japan, Korea, Taiwan and Singapore. And these uh, Studies show that modernization requires the strengthening of regulatory functions of the state, and only upon the successful outcomes of the modernization, one can think of weakening these functions and of passing them on to the society um, in part. In fact, the well-spread views of the weakening of the public and legal regulational approach um, as a prerequisite of the reforms came from the ideologies of the market economy. In fact, indeed, at, in many cases, the invisible hand of the market is um, there when we talk about the weakening of the regulatory functions. However, you just name at least one country where the reforms would go on alongside the weakening of the regulating functional role of the state. Today, we see what this weakening generated at the time of the global economy crunch when the manipulations with the financial markets led uh, to the global crunch or crisis not only politically but also economically. Essentially, it was a major paramount crisis of trust and confidence. In fact, these are the signs of the global turbulence that turn the human society into a multitude of societies uh, characterized by the global risk with an indefinite future, relating it back to the quotation from Voltaire. Now, what follows from what I've just said? I believe, and in fact, I've spoken about this already in my research, that we should start a cautious, well thought through, and a systemic revisiting of the international law, including the norms of the United Nations Charter and its conventions. And I'm not saying this as a judge. In fact, you know, when you have two principles out of 10 UN principles, it is very visible. One is the national state sovereignty. And at the same time, we have the principle of the right for self-identification and self-identity. Well, one may like one thing, the other one uh, may have a whole different preference. I mean, if you're eating a sweet cake, uh, if, you're, if you're having a cake with tea or coffee and you offer salt and sugar, people will have um, one taste if it's about enjoying a sweet dessert and you tell them to take some salt and you can also offer some steak and say have some salt or sugar. But strangely enough, people will opt for salt with a steak, uh, Henry um, says in one of his works, and this gradation is attributed to a Pilgrim, one of his characters. You have the sand that you can use to construct your house, but you can also have oats for your horse. So this goes to say that oats cannot be replaced by sand if you want to feed a horse. So depending on what we want to do, we really have to have a choice set up properly at the time of the reforms that really ought to be preemptive. But most importantly, not only should they be preemptive, but also they should rely on the social support and on the mass and public pillar of support. In fact, I believe the major social regulator at all times has been not the legal formalization of the law, 
and the legal formalities, but the moral law, the moral imperative we have inside that Immanuel Kant was talking about and the gap between the law and this uh, law of morality makes inapplicable the norms of law, but they may be truly impeccable. We have to understand that every society and every state is a complex system with its own specific culture, tradition, and morality, and with the various particular nuances of the moral imperative inside. And natural, naturally, there are always unique features of a specific uh, system going on in development along inside the uh, generally shared ones. At the same time, any reforms are systemic, social, and state transformation and transformations. And um, these always challenge the sustainability of the system against a destruction. The law is always a balance, an equilibrium of flexibility and the power of regulatory functions. But at the time of the reforms, um, you cannot let the legal harness go because this ends up in sacrifice sacrificing the legal regulating for flexibility that may be interpreted in different ways. This is an experience we've had after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in fact, in the mass conscience as well as in the legal system, there is absolutely no way we can oppose a human being, a state and a human being, and the civil society, and the civil society versus the state. And the goal and the outcome of our legal regulating should be the creation of a social situation whereby every citizen, every civil society, society and every state could coexist in an uninterrupted, constructive and synergetic unity. Today we're moving uh, forward to overcoming this legal challenge or barrier, and I do hope that relying on the international experience and the generals of law that have gone through many challenges most successfully and have learned the hard way from their experience, we will definitely uh, choose the right track. The colleagues, we have here another prominent partner of this forum. This is the International um, Association of Lawyers. Michael Reynolds. This year, Michael Reynolds is, represent, is representing AB today and as a practitioner, Mr. Reynolds works in anti-monopoly legislation, including the informational technologies. And as president, he is continuing his painstaking efforts to strengthen the cooperation of ABA with the lawyers of the world, including the BRICS country. Mr. Reynolds, you have to Thank you very much. <coughs> Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, uh, as president of the International Bar Association, it's an enormous pleasure for me to take part in this third legal forum, and I'd like to congratulate on behalf of the International Bar Association, the Ministry of Justice, and the organizers of this very uh, distinguished gathering to, for having brought together so many distinguished lawyers, um, academicians, economists from over 60 countries around the world. There are few cities, as the Prime Minister said, on the planet more beautiful for a conference than St. Petersburg, and particularly here in this spectacular setting in the new Mariinsky stage. And I'm pleased to announce uh, that the International Bar Association at its recent management board meeting decided in 2015 to hold our council meeting here in St. Petersburg, and that will bring to this city bar leaders and practitioners and leading law firms uh, from around the world here to St. Petersburg, and we're delighted at that. Now, one of the trainings of an officer of the IBA is to try, wherever you are, to say a few words in the local language, even if it means you might make a few mistakes. Our former Prime Minister in Britain, Winston Churchill, always advised that one should never desist from doing anything on the basis that you might make one or two mistakes. He said you should go ahead anyway. Uh, in fact, he said that success in politics amounts to proceeding from mistake to mistake without showing any detectable diminution of enthusiasm. Это большая честь уштатствовать в столь важной престижной конференции. It's a great honor for me. 
participate in this important and prestigious conference in St. Petersburg. Russia is one of the major venues for ABA and as president of ABA. I'm very pleased to see a lot of Russian lawyers here. We are delighted to deliver four sessions from IBA in this forum, and I wish everyone a successful conference. The International Bar Association was founded in 1947 in New York uh, by 34 national bar associations, and then in 1970 it uh, admitted individual lawyers into the organization. Now, in 2013, the IBA is composed of 200 national bar associations and law societies from 150 countries around the world. It has 50,000 individual members, and under its group membership scheme, 170 law firms from around the world, leading law firms, and that now includes leading law firms from Russia. And what I have seen during my time in the IBA is that whereas in 1947 a large number of those lawyers and bar associations came from the European Union or from um, the United States, we've now seen a huge growth in the market for legal services and the number of lawyers from other countries, from the emerging economies, from the BRICS countries. It's a very interesting statistic when you ask the question, what is the country with the highest number of lawyers in the world? Many people answer the United States. Well, it's not the United States. It's India with 1.3 million lawyers. The uh, second country in that league is the United States with about 860,000 lawyers. Number three in that list is Brazil uh, with about 700,000 lawyers. Number four, interestingly, is the country of Mexico. Uh, with uh, a large number of lawyers, I think nearly 500,000. And then coming up very closely after that, we now have China with a rapidly number, expanding number of lawyers and law firms and Russia. And indeed at the conference we had yesterday uh, with the Russian Chamber of Advocates, uh, Yevgeny uh, Semenyakov pointed out that uh, 20,000 of Russian lawyers are now under the age of 40. So it's a rapidly changing legal environment. And those lawyers are now actively involved in the various parts of the IBA, our legal practice division, which houses all our substantive law committees that look at issues like arbitration, mergers and acquisitions, antitrust, intellectual property, our section on professional interests, which looks at issues of legal ethics, etc., our Bar Issues Commission, which looks at the issues um, of establishing and strengthening bar associations around the world, and I'll come back to that, and the very important work of our Human Rights Institute, uh, which does a lot around the world for the upholding of individual human rights and the strengthening of the rule of law and the strengthening and capacity building for bar associations. Since its inception, the IBA has been devoted to promoting and um, promulgating the rule of law. Uh, it is a fundamental right for citizens to be heard by an independent judiciary uh, and that lawyers are able to practice freely without political interference. And a fundamental part of this is the establishment of a strong, well-regulated legal profession operating within the context of an independent bar association. Uh, and in the IBA, through our cumulative experience working with our network of bar associations around the world, uh, we have helped many bar associations build up these strong systems of internal governments, which comprise the establishment of um, strong ethical standards, the administration of fair and transparent entry requirements, the operation of disciplinary rules, and the protection uh, of members from government persecution. And I think over the course of years, we've had a success. The perception of lawyers around the world has improved. Um, this has always not always been the case. In the last century, here in St. Petersburg, uh, a play was put on in 1898 by Anton Chekhov. And one of the characters in the play says, doctors and lawyers, it's all the same. They're all the same, doctors and lawyers, but the difference is the lawyers rob you, but the doctors rob you and kill you. 
Well, I think we've come a long way since then. Here in Russia, uh, there is going to be a major reform in the way the legal profession in Russia is organized. This is hugely important, and the IBA is delighted to have been involved with the Ministry of Justice in their tremendous work to put forward this reform, which will have a major effect here in Russia and will establish a unified legal profession within one organization uh, and a well-regulated, properly organized legal profession with a fully operative bar association covering all lawyers. And uh, in our work, we've been using the IBA's principles on the conduct of the legal profession, which is based on common experience of bar associations around the world on issues such as the preservation of client confidentiality, confidential information, um, how you regulate conflicts of interest. And so the IBA really commends the Ministry of Justice for this very important work in the reform of the Russian legal profession, which will go a long way also to the establishment of the rule of law. And as the Prime Minister pointed out, there is a very direct uh, link between the rule of law and economic development. A healthy judicial system which uh, provides for an efficient and transparent legal environment opens the door for a strong economy. The uh, European Commissioner for Judicial Affairs and Human Rights the other day said in the European context, in the context of the European Union, that the rule of law and the rule of law being upheld translates directly into the confidence to invest in the economy. In our various committees in the IBA, we have experts from 160 countries around the world, leaders in their field. And I noted from the Prime Minister's speech the very important point he made that whereas we live in a globalized world where transactions are often international, globalized, but law remains national and the management of legal risk remains a matter of national law. And therefore the cooperation between lawyers um, of various jurisdictions is hugely important. And that is what we seek to nurture in our centers of excellence, in our committees in the IBA. And our committees also work closely with agencies and with government bodies to provide submissions giving the views of individual practitioners on legal reform, on the major legal reforms, such as the reforms the Prime Minister pointed out, the great reforms that are taking place here in Russia to create greater legal certainty. Um, and one of the examples of that you'll see in uh, one of the sessions which the IBA has contributed to this uh, forum, which will be a session on international cartel enforcement, where we've worked closely with the uh, Federalny Antimonopolny Slushba, the Federal Anti-Monopoly Service of the Russian Federation, um, bringing here the expertise from around the world in this very important area of anti-cartel enforcement. In the area of human rights, our Human Rights Institute has been at the forefront in putting forward the principles of individual human rights and the upholding of the rule of law through strengthening uh, bar associations and independent bar associations throughout the world, particularly in societies which have undergone rapid economic or political transformation or are even in a post-conflict situation. I'll give you one or two examples. We now have a major training product, project for members of the Tunisian judiciary. We have human rights training programs for parliamentarians in countries as diverse as the Ukraine, Mozambique, and the Lebanon. In Afghanistan in 2008, the IBA played a major role in establishing a new independent bar association, which took four years of work. And many of our lawyers from around the world, including lawyers from here in the Russian Federation, were helpful to us in um, persuading the Afghan lawyers that they needed to organize themselves into a strong bar association with a democratic uh, elected council, and that now is a very successful bar association operating in Afghanistan with 1,200 members. And perhaps the most recent and pressing example is Myanmar, where we sent a human rights uh, institute delegation to investigate the conditions in Myanmar, 
and I followed that up with a visit shortly after I took over as president. And it was very striking to me the great challenge that faces the IBA and I think many other organizations around the world in helping that country to put in place a proper rule of law and civil institutions following the neglect of the rule of law in that country since the coup of the generals in 1962. And I, as part of that visit, I was very privileged to uh, meet and uh, visit at her home after a long day in Napidor. I went to the charming house of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, known affectionately in uh, Burma, Myanmar as the lady. And she explained to me personally the real need in Burma now for change, for um, enhanced mechanisms to improve the rule of law. She told me how courts had been completely neglected, deprived of resources, how young uh, Burmese no longer wanted to become lawyers because of the way lawyers had been treated uh, under the military regime. And she asked directly for the help of the IBA in providing training, training for judges, training for lawyers, as well as material help uh, for the court system. And on all of that, we are immediately acting. Uh, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Russian lawyers and law firms are increasingly involved in international transactions, and that's going to increase following the accession of Russia uh, to the WTO. And the International Bar Association gives those lawyers access to our committees where they can work with individual lawyers from other jurisdictions from ar around the world who are leaders in their field, leaders of expertise. It gives them access to know-how. Uh, here in Russia, the IBA has organized and will continue to organize many conferences in areas such as antitrust, uh, arbitration, mergers and acquisition, and every year we now have in Moscow a very important conference on law firm management devoted to the essentials of how you run and operate a law firm partnership. What are the best practices? What are the worst practices? What can you learn from the mistakes that have been committed elsewhere? Um, and finally, I would like to uh, say once again how much we support the very important impending reform of the legal profession here in Russia, and we're very happy to support that exercise with the Ministry of Justice. Reforms are not always easy. Peter the Great, um, the founder of this great city, was a great reformer. He once said, however, uh, and I think this was after his famous embassy when he had gone to uh, Rotterdam and uh, Amsterdam to learn how to build ships. He said, my great desire is to reform my subjects, but I am ashamed to confess I am unable to reform myself. I think he was referring to his exuberant behavior on that occasion. Um, Peter the Great also said, and it is near the lunch hour, I think it's very appropriate, destiny may ride with us, but that's no need for it to interfere with lunch. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Reynolds. Yet again, I would like to thank all the participants of this discussion for your most substantial and most interesting contributions. And now I would like to give the floor to Dmitry Medvedev for his final remarks. Esteemed colleagues, I have faithfully making notes. Last year I was making them on iPad, but then they told me that I was playing all, the fo all through the forum. So now I was noting by hand, so there, there will be no doubt that I was writing the notes. So the topics that were, the issues that were raised by our colleagues are uh, multifaceted, uh, very informative, though there were a lot of uniting aspects as well. For example, the discussion about the role of rule of law, that discussion was uh, 
obvious in the statements of all our colleagues, of Mr. Obstelton, Mr. Tonka, Mr. Reynolds, and in other statements as well, we could hear that. And for us, it is no doubt any experience would be interesting. Moreover, that we have embarked on this problem quite recently, some 20 years ago, and now our legal system undergoes a very, a very important development. Sometimes it is criticized, which is justified, sometimes it is not justified, but anyway, for us, such statements, such speeches are very informative and useful, since we have a lot of things to do. We have a, lot, a long way ahead of us. It is it should be recognized that many things that we lawyers thought thought very stable last year, but last year our perceptions has changed. But however, there are some some very important blocks, very important lawyers' positions that are not subject to any revisiting in our contemporary age as well. For example, the humanity spent a lot of effort in the 19th and in 20th century to create the fundamental principles and, of course, by no means we should bury those principles due to some international crisis or or due to other reasons. Thank you. I, I thank my colleagues for listening carefully to my statement, and they could catch what I wanted to say about two principles that are competing in national legal systems, the trend to nationalize different issues and the trend to globalize the whole raft of issues as well. I do not think that any trend will overcome the other, but I would like for everybody to see my to see my statement as meaning that national trends and uh, national issues will dominate. No, of course not. The, those principles will go along with other principles, and but still the principle of the national sovereignty remains the key principle of the international law. Our constitution is quite a, is quite a young one. Valery Dmitrich has referred to that, not as a judge, not as a justice, but as a, as a scientist. But uh, judging from his statement, I understood that he was making his speech as a chairman of the Constitutional Court as well. We should study all the constitutional processes underway in our countries, all the more that, they, that globally we have graphic examples of in constitutional laws at work, as Mr. Andy Cott mentioned, habeas cor corpus is a key principle, and in spite of the difference between our legal systems, this is a good indicator for us how our legal system should be developed in the future. But there is no doubt that British, that the British themselves have many have many claims to the development of their own systems, though they are engaged in the development of global legal systems actively. Mr. Reynolds has mentioned very interesting figures, especially the figures pertaining to the number of lawyers in India. As for the, our country, my vision is that our lawyer community is growing very fast. When I was moving from St. Petersburg to, Mos to Moscow, we had two or three educational institutions. One is my alma mater, but now there are around 50 of them in St. Petersburg. And of course, there is difference in education approaches. We all have to engage in law education because much depends on the 
students' training, we have to boost the international cooperation in this area, and we will spare no effort in doing that. Russia is not only undergoing changes now, but we, together with our partners from Belarus and Kazakhstan, have created our own integration system. We are following closely what is happening in the European Union, and we will try to to learn from the mistakes of our European friends in order not to repeat them. And I would wish our European friends to overcome those difficulties that they are faced with now, because I believe that the idea to create an integrational entity is a good idea and uh, it will serve for, for the peoples, for the states. Both. I'm very glad that we have met in this hall today and I'm sure that the discussion that will be held here will serve best for our legal systems and for ourselves as well, because lawyers, it is very important for lawyers to communicate with each other. It is our special thing. Thank you very much and good luck. Прошу всех участников форума пройти на ланч.